left quick. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just want to take a quick second to thank you all for uh, coming out today at lunch. Uh, we're very pleased to have Peter here today to uh, to speak with you. For those of you uh, I've not met, my name is David Cuson. I'm the CEO of Euro Pacific Canada. Um, one of the things that Peter is well known for is being uh, vocal, direct, uh, and consistent in the marketplace. And uh, we saw that through uh, 06, 07, 08, 09. Um, you know, a lot of people criticized him for uh, his outlook generically and for the fact that his outlook was unwavering and he was consistent in that delivery. Uh, you know, today we see and get some of that same feedback. You know, when we were uh, talking to accounts today uh, and talking to uh, other institutions when Peter was coming up, Peter, you know, the people would say, well, has Peter's message changed in, in the last six months? Uh, and in many cases, uh, depending on the topic, the answer was no, because the macro environment hasn't changed, and Peter's outlook by extension hasn't changed. So uh, it's, it's a challenging environment for, for all of us in the, in the capital markets environment and for institutions that are soliciting capital from investors. Uh, liquidity has dried up, uh, volatility has increased, and all of us are, are trying to understand where do those capital allocations go, how do we best obtain real returns of, of, uh, of capital. And uh, that's really one of the things that we wanted Peter to talk about today, is really understanding where are we now in, uh, in the economy, uh, what's the outlook. Um, I think you can probably guess what Peter's outlook is for the US. Uh, but, but really, what do we do uh, knowing that? How do we allocate our capital? How do we protect our investors? How do we earn a, a rate of return that's, uh, that's attractive? So uh, with that said, Peter, I'd like to introduce you to the room and, uh, and have you uh, give us your address. reason. And I think that we've, we've had uh, a, a, a sense of optimism uh, that I think is unwarranted by the facts. And I think the people who are optimistic that we've turned a corner, you know, that after years, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the plants that the Fed has you know, planted that are now sprouting up, that you know, the stimulus has worked, and now the economy is recovered, the U.S. economy is recovering. The housing market is back. The stock market is at new highs. Um, so the Fed can now begin to withdraw uh, the stimulus because it's not needed anymore. It's time to take the training wheels off the bike. Everything, everything is good. I think that that perception has kind of taken hold, um, maybe in the last six months or so. And I think it's completely wrong. It's completely unfounded uh, by the actual evidence that, that's out there. But some people just look at the stock market, they look at the real estate market, and they draw conclusions from these prices as if the markets somehow are right. That if the stock market is up, that it must mean that the economy is strong. Or if the housing market is up, it must, must be a good thing. Well, remember, the stock market and the housing market were both rising in 2005 and 2006, 2007. That's when all the problems were created. So the markets didn't anticipate anything. I mean, people were mistaken back then when they looked at these rising markets, high rising asset prices, and they drew conclusions about the health of the economy. The conclusions that they drew were wrong. That's why they were blindsided by what happened in 2008, and that's why they're blindsided by what's about to happen, which is going to be much worse. Because the people who didn't see that <coughs> crisis, and there are certainly a lot of them, they didn't understand what was going on in the U.S. economy, and they still don't understand it. That's why they think the problems have been solved, because they never understood those problems in the first place. When they look at the housing market going up, and they think, well, this is great. But no, it's not great. That's, that's still part of the problem. Housing prices are still too high. That was the problem. The solution was that they come down. Now, when that happens, it exposes a lot of the mistakes and the misallocations of resources and malinvestments, and so we've got to clean up the mess. But. You know, nobody wants to do that. They'd rather preserve the mistakes so we can postpone having to deal with the consequences of those mistakes. And you've got this narrative now that, well, the U.S. economy is recovering. Why? What are they basing all that on? Well, 
One is, is, is the stock market or the real estate market. But why, why are stock prices up? Is it because the American economy is so much more productive? U.S. corporations are making all these capital investments and now we're producing more stuff and we have more economic output? No. Stock prices are up because corporations are buying back their own stock. Where are they getting the money? They're borrowing it because it's cheap. They can borrow money at very, very low rates of interest and buy back their stocks. Now their earnings per share goes up because right now the interest that they have to pay on that borrowed money is lower than the earnings for the shares. It's not because, you know, that doesn't benefit the economy, the fact that these companies are doing these buybacks. It doesn't even benefit the corporation. It temporarily benefits the shareholders as long as the interest rates stay low, which is one of the reasons why the Fed can't raise rates, because that'll reverse that process. Why are real estate prices up? Because of speculators. The home ownership rate in the United States now is at a, like a 50-year low. So how can the home ownership rate go down when the housing market, who's buying all these houses? Speculators. They're not living in these houses. They're vacant. They're empty houses. That's why furniture sales have been falling during the entire housing recovery, because no one has to furnish a house that nobody is living in. They're vacant houses. Now, some of these houses are on the rental market, but most of them are for rent, but nobody has rented them, because people can't afford them. Most people don't want to rent a single family home. They'd rather rent an apartment, or condominium, maybe a town home. There's not a big market for single family homes. I mean, I used to rent my single family home uh, for years during the housing bubble. And I knew my landlord was losing money on me because it's difficult. I mean, just between the property taxes that you have to pay on a single family home, the maintenance, of course you got all the lawn care and it's bigger maintenance, you know, but uh, insurance. And a lot of times when you have a house on the market, you know, you can be six months a year between tenants. You know, you don't know how it's, it takes. It's 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 much different when you're you know when when you're trying to rent a house. So I think a lot of these hedge funds and speculators that have you know, rushed into the market. You know, in some of the markets, you have 40, 50 percent of the houses were bought with all cash, no mortgage. That's not a that's not a homeowner. You know, if you're buying a two or three hundred thousand dollar house with all cash. You're, you're a speculator. The American who's buying a $200,000 home, he could barely come up with a down payment, let alone pay the whole thing. If he had $200,000, he'd use that as a down payment on a million dollar home. He's not going to go all in on a $200,000 home. These are all speculators. And so that's why the market's gone up. But of course, when you take away the cheap money, the market goes right back down. What happens when the speculators try to sell these houses? Who's going to buy them? I mean, all we had was the speculators. Meanwhile, the speculators have bid up prices, and mortgage rates have risen now from the low threes to the mid fours, which may not sound like a lot, but it's a big deal when, we, when you're looking at monthly payments. So you don't have the supply of buyers in the economy. Meanwhile, look at the job market. People look at the unemployment rate, and they think, oh, well, that's a sign. The economy has improved. Look, the unemployment rate is down to 7.3%, which is still a big number, even if it were legitimate, but it's not. Why is the unemployment rate coming down in America? Is it because unemployed people are finding jobs? No. It's because the unemployed people have stopped looking for jobs, and therefore we no longer have to count them as being unemployed. Right? Last month, when the government revised down the previous month's job creation from about 170,000 down to 105,000, and of course the majority of those 105,000 jobs are part-time jobs that merely replace the full-time jobs that were destroyed. But the government said that we created 169,000 jobs, but 330,000 people left the labor force that month. So 330,000 fewer people were employed in August than in July. And that's the, the establishment numbers. The household survey had over 500,000 people leaving the labor force. The labor force participation rate in the United States is the lowest it's been since 1978. This month, 63.2, uh, I think it is. And back in 1978, one of the reasons that the labor force participation rate was that low was because most married women didn't have to work. So they weren't part of the labor force because they didn't have to be part of it because their husbands could support them. Today, most husbands can't support their wives, so their wives need to work. But they're leaving the labor force anyway because there's no jobs for them or the only jobs they can get 
you know, the pay is not high enough to make it worthwhile because you have to pay taxes and then you have to deal with the cost of uh, child care or maybe you can go on welfare. In uh, Connecticut, where I live, uh, they just did a study of the value of welfare benefits in Connecticut. And if you're a single woman and you have two kids, you can get $29,000 a year in tax-free <coughs> welfare benefits. So you can qualify for five different welfare programs. So in order to get a job that would give you the same after-tax income, you need to earn upwards of $40,000 a year. But then, even if you take that job, if you're a woman with two kids, what are you going to do with your kids when you're at work? You need child care. How much does it cost you to get to work? What if the job you get is a half-hour commute? You've got to buy gas. You need a car. You've got to, get, you got to get, you know, do your hair, do your makeup. You need work clothes. You got to, it's expensive to get, a, to get a job. And then, of course, you know, I mean, why, why work if you earn the same money not working? I mean, most people would rather have leisure than, than, than a menial job. So pretty much, I mean, you know, in order for you to convince a welfare mother in Connecticut to take a job, you're probably going to have to pay seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year. But why? They probably have no skills anyway, so they they're never going to get jobs. So the labor force is is shrinking in the United States, and so that's you know that, that's why the unemployment rate is going down. It's not because people are finding jobs. So we we don't have any in, in, improvement there. People look at the GDP and they think, well, the GDP is bigger, only because the inflation numbers are smaller. That's really what's going on. So now, the most recent GDP, the second quarter GDP, in order to get the 2.5% growth that they claim we have, uh, they're, they're saying that inflation is 0.7% annualized. It's like the lowest in 50 years. Now, I don't believe that for a second. I don't think inflation is that low, especially when you poll Americans and ask them, what is your biggest economic concern? The number one answer is always rising prices. So how can so many people be concerned about inflation when, according to the government, it's the lowest in 50 years? <coughs> so I think that the, the GDP growth is an illusion. I think the U.S. economy is contracting. I think it's been contracting for years, and I think it will continue to contract. And that is the truth behind the U.S. economy. And the reason that it is going to continue to contract is because of the monetary and fiscal policies that we're pursuing. Because we're not solving any of our economic problems, we're exacerbating them. And the Fed doesn't want to admit what it needs to do. And right now everybody is talking about, oh, okay, the Fed is going to taper. They're supposed to announce um, this, this month, maybe next week, what they're going to do. Now, the minute they started talking about tapering, I was saying that, well, they're not going to do it. And if you look at their language, they never actually say, we are going to taper. And this is by how much and at what date. It's all depending on what the data is. But they don't give you any concrete numbers, like if this, then we're going to do that. It's all subjective. Why? Because they know they're going to look for an excuse not to do it. Whatever the data is going to be, it's not going to be strong enough for them to taper. They, don't even, they might not even know what excuse they're going to use yet, but they're looking for one. Maybe they'll blame it on Syria. I don't know. They're going to think of something, because the one thing they can't do is, is taper, because the entire recovery that they believe they've created is completely dependent on an ever-increasing flow of that cheap money. In fact, not only can't they taper, they're going to have to go bigger. They're going to have to do more than $85 billion a month of QE. And ultimately, they're going to have to buy more than just treasuries and mortgages. They're going to have to buy muni bonds. They're going to have to buy corporate bonds. If they want to keep interest rates artificially low, they're going to have to keep buying more and more. But the problem is the more bonds they buy, the higher interest rates have to go because the more money they have to create to buy up all those bonds. You know, it's like uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Disney character trying to... You know, get all the water out or plug up the, 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 the holes in, in, in the dam. You, you know, when you plug up one, you get another one. So this is what the Fed is going to have to deal with. And if you remember, again, when before they talked about tapering, they talked about exiting. And when they said that, I, I was publicly stating that that was a lie, that the Fed had no intention to exit, that it had no exit plan because exit was impossible. And, you know, when Ben Bernanke first went on 60 Minutes and he was asked, you know, you know, people are criticizing you, 
for monetizing the debt, Ben Bernanke said, well, I'm not monetizing the debt. And when he was asked to explain that, his answer was, well, we're going to sell the bonds that we bought. So therefore, it's not really monetizing because we're going to sell them. Which I think was a lie at the time because, look, if you steal a car and then you claim, well, you just borrowed it, you weren't really <laughs> stealing it, it doesn't matter. Even if you do give it back, you still stole it when you took it. You didn't have permission. So if the Fed is turning debt into money, if it is taking bonds and creating money, that is monetizing debt. It doesn't matter if they unmonetize it in the future. The fact is they're monetizing it in the present. But now Ben Bernanke has said that he's not going to sell the debt. So then he's admitted to, it, to uh, monetizing. In fact, one of the reasons that he was forced to basically disclose that he would never sell the debt that he would hold it till maturity. That was his original, the original explanation, look, we don't have to sell it, we'll hold it to maturity. And it was because people were worried about what would happen to the bond market if the Fed started to sell. Right? Well, because who would buy? The Fed's the buyer. How can the Fed sell? No one else is gonna buy. So Ben Bernanke, recognizing that, said, well, we're not gonna sell. We're just gonna let the bonds mature. As if that matters. Because it doesn't matter if they let the bond mature, because if they let the bond mature, where is the government going to get the money to pay the Fed off? The Treasury is going to have to sell a new bond into the market to retire that bond. So it's the same thing. It's a distinction without the difference. It doesn't matter to the bond market whether it's the Fed that sells or the Treasury. Somebody's going to have to sell that bond and nobody's going to buy it. But now Ben Bernanke is just basically saying, we're, not even, we're going to roll it over. Now he went from saying we're going to let them mature to we're going to roll them over. Because he knows. He can't let them mature either. And in fact, not only is he claiming that he's going to roll over the maturing debt, but he's going to loan back to the Treasury any interest that they earn on the treasures they own. The only thing they're talking about now is tapering. And again, they're talking about it. They're not doing it. They're talking about it. But tapering is not exiting. Tapering is still going deeper in. Right? If the Fed says we're going to reduce the rate at which we expand our balance sheet, from $85 billion a month to $75 billion a month or $65 billion a month, they haven't exited from anything. They're still expanding the balance sheet. They're just doing it at a slightly slower rate. But I don't even think that they could do that because what's going to happen if the Fed tapers and the bond market continues to fall, rates continue to rise, I think the yield on the 10-year, assuming that they continue with their tapering, and if they do taper, um, the yields on the 10 years will be at 4% relatively soon. They're just about at 3% now, but it's not going to take long to get to 4%. The yields on the 30-year the bonds will get up at 5.5% pretty quickly. That means mortgages are going to have to be around 5.5%, 6% from where they are now, which is 4 and 5 eighths, 4 and 3 quarters. I mean, the housing market will be toast, and the U.S. economy will be right back in a recession. So then what's the Fed going to do? Right? What does the Fed do in recessions? It stimulates. Well, it's already got interest rates at zero, so what's the only thing you can do? It's already, and it's already doing QE. So we go back into a recession, and we're, we're all, all they can do is increase the QE. So if they taper now, they're just going to have to untaper later. They're going to have to do an about face, and they're going to have to start doing even more than $85 billion a month, $100 billion a month, $125 billion a month. Now, I mean, that's probably a very frightening prospect for the Fed, to have to taper and then untaper. I mean, that would really cause it to lose a lot of credibility. A, you know, obviously it, was, it would have to admit that tapering was a mistake, right, when it has to reverse it. It would have to admit that it overestimated the strength of the economy. So it would rather not do that. It would rather not taper at all than have to, you know, reverse what it did. But also, it would expose to the world the fragile and phony nature of the recovery that Ben Bernanke thinks he's created. If the minute you just taper a little bit, the whole thing implodes, what does that say? Maybe people will start to question the fact that it doesn't even work, which of course it doesn't. I mean, that's, you know, when you, it, it, I laugh when I see all this weak economic data and people argue that, oh, look, the Fed can't stop the QE because the economy is weak. But that means the QE hasn't worked. So it's because it hasn't worked that we should do more of it. But it can never work, So, which is why it has to keep on coming. But that the Fed 
does that, tapers, pulls back, and the economy is back in recession, people are going to, more people will think that, wait a minute, maybe it just doesn't work. So I think the easiest course of action for the Fed is to not do anything. And to just keep on promising to taper in the future based on the data. So that people will, you know, will think that, okay, yeah, you know, the Fed is going to do it. We're not going to have QE forever. You know, I, I kind of described it to people as like an airplane, like QE. Firstly, you know, I used to talk about QE like it was a, like, a, like a ship, you know, like the Queen Elizabeth, except I called it the Titanic. But now I've been kind of comparing it to an airplane, and Ben Bernanke is the pilot of this plane. And he knows how to take off. We know that. He knows how to start QE, and he definitely knows how to keep the plane flies the plane in the air, he can continue to QE. But the one thing he doesn't know how to do is land the plane. And, but that's, he can't admit to the passengers he doesn't know how to land the plane. <laughs> because then there'd be chaos on that plane. Right? So what does he do? He pretends that he can land. And so he says, okay, we're going to be landing shortly. And then he's going to, how about, you know, the weather's not right, a little foggy, we're going to have to circle a little bit longer. He has to come up with an excuse why he can't land. And maybe he's hoping he'll figure it out. Maybe he's looking at some manuals. <laughs> but the problem is, you know, he's going to run out of gas. And then he's got no choice. Right? And then the plane's going to crash. And that, you know, the Fed is going to run out of gas. They can't, they can't do this indefinitely. Because, the, you know, the dollar is rallied based on the perception that the Fed is going to tighten, based on the perception that the U.S. economy is recovering. Well, when reality is that it's not recovering, that it's headed back into recession, and that the Fed isn't going to tighten, and in fact we're going to get more and bigger QE, then the dollar rolls over. You know? And you know, if you remember how much pressure the dollar was under before 2008, I mean the dollar was making record lows in 2008 before the financial crisis actually saved the dollar. Because people reacted to that crisis by buying dollars. And you know, that actually bought us you know, in the United States a lot of extra time because we had all kinds of new money we could spend that people were lending us. But when the dollar resumes that downward trajectory, remember oil prices got up to $150 a barrel before 2008. They're headed there again. Um, but as the dollar goes down, that will make those prices rise that much faster. But as the dollar comes down, it's going to put more and more upward pressure on prices in the United States. And prices are rising. The government can lie about it all they want. But prices are going up. And one of the ways that a lot of the companies in the United States have been dealing with rising prices, because they know that their, their consumers are broke. Right? The average American is barely making ends meet because he has no money. He's loaded up with debt. In fact, one of the reasons that if you look at the credit card companies like um, MasterCard and Visa, they've got record earnings. But if you look at the department stores, their sales are plunging. So. If Americans are using all their credit cards, but they're not going to Walmart, they're not going to Macy's, they're not going to JCPenney's, they're not going to Bloomingdale's, what are they spending on? They're buying food. They're buying gasoline. They, they're, they're, they used to have a full-time job, and now they have a part-time job. So how do they make ends meet with a credit card? That's what's going on. And I also think that a lot of these Americans have made a conscious decision that they don't care at this point how much they owe, because they can't pay back what they borrowed. The balance is so big that they might as well just go out with a bank. I mean, once you know that you're going to go bankrupt, you would, you're going to max out all your credit cards. You're going to spend as much, because you know that once you go bankrupt, then you can't do it anymore. But why go bankrupt only owing $30,000 when you can go bankrupt owing $50,000? They don't take the stuff away. When you go bankrupt, they don't, you don't have to give back all the stuff you bought. I mean, if you have an asset, they, yeah, but if you just have flat screen TVs and a, a wardrobe through a clothes, you don't have to give that stuff back when you go bankrupt. You get to keep everything you bought. So people are using credit cards because they're broke. They're using credit cards uh, to buy things that they used to be able to afford. But the real, the real economy is contracting. And so, so, so they don't have, they don't have the, the spending power. Real incomes, in fact, real incomes are falling at a faster pace in America during the recovery than they did during the expansion or during the recession. So during the recovery, real incomes are falling faster than they did during the recession, which is a, a, kind of an amazing accomplishment you know, for Obama, because he's kind of, it's one of his campaign promises that I guess he's, he's, he's kept, because he promised change. 
And it's, it, it's a big change to have a recession, I mean a recovery that's, that's worse than the recession that you're recovering from. But what the companies have been doing to kind of keep a lid on prices is they're just reducing the, the portions or the, the, qu the quality of what's in their products. So in packaging, I mean, if it's a roll of toilet paper, you know, they'll take 10% of the sheets out. You know, or they'll put fewer, fewer hot dogs buns in the, in the container, or they'll, they'll just put less cereal in the box. Or, you know, people go to restaurants and they'll, they'll get smaller portions, you know, for the same price. I mean, but there's a limit to how small you can make the products, uh, you know, it, 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 because it's going to be ridiculous. I mean, they can't sell, you know, the hot dog buns individually wrapped. You know, in order, and then, you know, eventually they have to raise prices, and they're they're raising their prices. And of course, you know, as more and more prices, the government the government has to keep going down. I mean, the government can't keep claiming that inflation is lower and lower and lower in order to pretend that the economy is growing and do it with any kind of a straight face. Because at some point, it's obvious how much prices are going up, and then we're going to get a crisis. Because I think the bond market, and the Fed might have already lost control of the bond market. I mean, the Fed is already upset that interest rates have gone up as much as they have on the longer end. And they're trying to go out of the way to say, look, we don't want this. I mean, we're, we're saying we're going to keep interest rates at zero. Just because we're tapering, it doesn't mean that we're tightening. We're still, we still have our foot on the gas. We're just easing it up a little bit. They're trying to reassure everybody that the cheap money is going to keep on flowing, but interest rates are rising anyway. And that's a big problem for the Fed. And if the Fed, so I, I, if the Fed were to taper even a little bit, I think that would exacerbate the problems for the bond market in the short run because now the market is not say, okay, the Fed has actually started. You know, we can't wait. We better get rid of the bonds. I mean, why would you want to hold a 10-year Treasury yielding 3%? What's the point? I mean, because obviously the 3% coupon is not going to be enough to offset you for the loss of principal when interest rates rise. And those, those rising interest rates, you know, destroy the economy, that the Fed, the phony economy. It's not just the stock market and the housing market. The banks are going to be in a lot of trouble when rates go up. A lot of these big banks are going to be under a lot of pressure. Uh, many of them would fail. But if the Fed is tightening, even though it's not technically tight, where's the money going to come from the bailout of bank that fails? I mean, the Fed can't ease and tighten simultaneously. It's either one or the other. But rates, if rates go up, the banks, big banks are going to fail. But also the government. I mean, the federal government is probably the most leveraged institution to rates. Because we have this phony economy that is dependent on excess consumption financed by debt. And as interest rates go up and the economy contracts, the government loses its revenue. At the same time, its expenditures increase because of all these safety nets and different things. So the budget deficits will go up as interest rates are going up. Rising rates will weaken the economy and exacerbate the budget deficit. But now you have a bigger deficit that needs to be financed at higher rates. But the added problem is the fact that it's not just the money that you have to borrow to finance your current budget deficit, but all the money you have to borrow to retire the maturing debt that matures that year, and if not retire it, convince lenders to loan you enough money to repay it. Right? Because in the next year, I don't know the exact number, but maybe it's $4 trillion or $5 trillion worth of treasury debt matures. So we have to borrow that money. In addition to what the annual budget deficit is, we have to borrow all that money. Now, in many cases, we borrow it from the same people who loaned it to us originally. Right? They'll loan it back. They'll, you know. But what if they don't want to because the rates are too low? Where are we going to get the money? It's, we can't get the money. We don't, we don't have it. So rates have to rise to a high enough point to convince people to, call, to hold on to those bonds that they didn't want at 3%. Well, maybe they'll want 4%. Maybe they'll want 5%. But the problem is, at some point, we can't afford to pay 5% interest on the national debt. We don't have the money. Right now, we're paying about... $250 billion a year on $17 trillion worth of debt. We're paying less today in interest on the debt than we did when Reagan was president, and the debt was under $2 trillion. So, and, and all that is the magic of you know 0% interest rates. 
But what if interest rates were at five percent? We can't afford it. You know, I mean, we, we, we were screaming bloody murder about the sequester. The sequester had to do with, I don't know, 40 or 50 billion dollars worth of cuts. And the cuts were just cuts to the baseline assumptions of increases. I mean, the, 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 the interest rates of interest expense went to a trillion dollars a year, which is where interest rate interest expenses would be in a few years. If the national debt goes to 20 trillion, which of course it's on the trajectory to get there pretty soon, um, five percent of 20 trillion is a trillion. You know, can the government spend a trillion dollars a year, 10 trillion dollars over 10 years? Because they always like to talk about 10 years. Can the government come up with an extra 10 trillion dollars just to pay interest on the debt? No. What happens if interest rates go to 10 percent? That's you know, 10 percent. I mean, they could go there. What would that be? I mean, we're we're a race. Look at countries like Italy or Spain, where rates have gone to seven, eight percent. People, do you think America can handle rates of seven or eight percent any better than Italy or Spain? No, we're actually in a worse position to handle those rates. We have more debt relative to GDP, and we have a shorter maturity on that debt. So, the Fed knows that Congress can't sustain an increase in interest rates. I mean, it's, we can't pay the, the principal of the debt. We can't pay anybody back. That's, you know, that's a given. But we can pretend, as long as interest rates are low, we can pretend that, you know, that we're solvent, just like you know, when a lot of people bought their, um, their houses during the housing bubble. One of the reasons that they could pretend that they can afford the house was because they had a teaser rate. And they can afford that payment. For the first couple of years, they had a rate that they could afford. They couldn't afford the mortgage because after a couple of years, the rate would shoot up. But it didn't matter. All that mattered was could they swing the payment initially? Because it didn't matter two or three years from now because the real estate was just going to go up. And they could just refinance it, sell it at a profit. So it didn't matter if they couldn't afford the actual mortgage. They could afford the teaser rate. So that's what we can afford right now. We can afford you know, the teaser rate. We can afford the $250 billion. But can we afford a trillion? Or two trillion a year? And no, not. I mean, it's not even close. Plus, it's actually getting bigger because you know I, I mentioned that the economy is contracting. That um, as the labor force is shrinking, the government has a smaller tax base. A lot of these people were paying into the Social Security system. Now they're not. Now a lot of them are now drawing down. We have a record number of Americans that are now collecting disability. The disability rolls have skyrocketed. Millions of people are now on disability, that weren't on disability a few years ago. They're not actually disabled. You know, the disability is they can't find a job. So now they're collecting from the Social Security funds, but they're no longer paying into it. So it, it's a big number when you take somebody who was paying in and now they're drawing down. But that also happens as people retire. Somebody who's 65, who just, lost, who just retires, he stops paying the taxes and starts drawing the benefits. So it, the government gets hit from both ends. So that, that is making the situation worse. And one of the things, one of the reasons that the budget deficit has come down a bit, it's still horrific, right? It's still like 700 billion. So it's not, you know, they're, I, I, you, know you see some of the politicians, they're, they're bragging about how the deficit has come down. Which is, you know, it's like if your kid, you know, brags about, you know, he's got an F plus now on his report card. You know, and it's not an F. And it's still a huge deficit. It's nothing to get, you know, excited about. but. It's because of the bubble that the deficit has come down. A lot of money is coming to the Treasury, Fannie and Freddie. They've been making big profits over the last year. Those profits are about to turn into losses. Fannie and Freddie is going to have to start sending Congress a bill again for their losses. And the FHA is going to need a huge bailout. And so that's going to cost money that, that isn't in there. So a lot of this stuff is going to reverse, and the deficits are going to head north of a trillion anyway. But of course, once we get into a recession and interest rates go up, the deficits are going to be much, much bigger. So I don't think that the Fed is going to change policy at all until it's forced to, which means that a lot of assumptions that investors are making now are wrong. A lot of the decisions that they've made, the assets that they've chosen to sell or buy, based on these false assumptions, a lot of those trades are going to have to be reversed. A lot of those positions are going to have to be unwound. Uh, because assets must be mispriced if people are betting on a recovery that's not going to happen in the United States. If they're betting on a strengthening dollar, that's not going to happen. 
you know, and again, I keep hearing this argument, oh, you know, yeah, the problems are bad, but, you know, they're worse every place else. That, you know, America is the, is, the, is, is, the, is the least dirty shirt, right, of all, the, of all the shirts. And that's just not the case. But you know what happens? Because the dollar is the reserve currency, at least for now, we benefit any time anybody is worried about anybody else's problems. Even if our problems are bigger than the ones that they're worried about at the moment, they still take refuge in the dollar. So if there's a problem in Europe and people buy the dollar, well then you know, we get a benefit out of that. Because we get to spend that money. Somebody loans us money, we get to spend it. And now our GDP gets bigger because all we do is count the spending. That's all part of GDP. It doesn't matter how much debt we accumulate in order to generate that GDP. No one cares about that. They just look at the actual number. And if we can borrow more money, we can spend more money. But it doesn't mean we can pay any of it back. But at some point, our creditors are going to have to you know, come to terms with the fact that we can't pay them back. Because you, you, you don't loan money unless you expect to get paid back. I mean, that's the whole, that's the main part of a loan, right? That is the, you know, that, if that doesn't work out, then the whole thing is a disaster, right? If you don't get your money back, then it's a bad loan, right? I mean, that, the, the hard part, the most important part of the lending process is getting your money back, right? Just making a loan, it's easy to make a loan, especially if you don't care if the person pays you back, it's easy to make loans. But, when our creditors realize that it is impossible for the government to pay us back. Because eventually rates have to rise. I said that the, the biggest problem with the US economy is that rates are too low. That you know, all of our, all of our problems basically stem from that. The, the, the tri all the big misallocations of resources, the malinvestments, everything that's wrong with the economy boils down to the fact that rates are just too low, and it's, it's, it's sending all kinds of bad economic signals. I mean, you can say, well, the problem is the government is too big. Yeah, but why is the government too big? Because rates are too low. Could the government be this big if it couldn't borrow all this money? No. It couldn't be, borrow all this money if interest rates weren't this low. So there's all sorts of problems that are rooted in the fact that the, the Fed has price-fixed money. And that's probably that's worse for the economy than if they you know, fix the price of oil, or the price of milk, or the price of bread, or any other commodity. When they fix the price of money and they get that wrong, money enters into a, you know, all these transactions. All these decisions are, are made based on the cost of money. And so we have all these huge imbalances. And the imbalances just grow bigger and bigger and bigger as long as the rates are low. So what we need is to have a big increase in interest rates so that we can repair the damage. And what would that mean? That would mean asset prices would fall, that would mean stock prices would go down, it would mean real estate, real estate prices would go down, it would mean government spending would have to be slashed, government programs. I mean, there would have to be all these reforms that would, that would be forced to take place. People would lose money, creditors would lose a bunch of money. But they're going to lose the money anyway. So the only question is how do they lose it? Are they going to lose it to a default, a restructuring, or are they going to lose it to inflation? But the lenders cannot pay the money back, not in real terms. Uh, so default is, is preferable to inflation from an economic perspective. Um, but from a political perspective, the politicians prefer inflation. But it's only because they think they could create just enough of it so it doesn't get out of control. I mean, that, that is the master plan, is just to gradually debase the dollar, create enough inflation to reduce the real value of our liabilities, and, and somehow it's all going to work out. I mean, that, that is the plan. But I think that's always the plan. I mean, nobody sets out to destroy their currency. Right? They just want to destroy it a little bit. Right? But it can't work. And it's not going to work. I mean, there's too many people that own dollars, and they're not going to just gradually you know, watch their wealth erode. You know, once people really appreciate that this is the plan, it's a gradual um, depreciation of the dollar, then it can't be gradual anymore because everybody wants get out. And so I think that there is going to be a, a, you know, a crisis that's coming relatively soon. You know, maybe the Fed not tapering or taping you know, could be another thing that accelerates the crisis. Because it puts you a step further to people acknowledging what's going on. But when the dollar really starts to fall and interest rates start to rise, that's when you know, we get the crisis that we didn't get in 2008. Because now, you know, 
Now the Fed has to do something. Right? They, they can't just ease up on the gas pedal at that point. Right? They have to slam on, on the brakes. And it's going to be a big, big change for, for the markets, for the economy. How long they can put it off, it's hard to say. You know, how, how long they can, they, they can get away with postponing it. They're going to try to do it. I mean, you know they're going to try to do it you know, if they think they can get it done through the next presidential election. It's always, you know, when is the next election? So what they're always trying to get, get, get elected one more time. There's, we have uh, midterm elections coming up in 2014. So if they think about those. But in the meantime, you know, what do you do with investments in light of this? Well, you, if, if, if you're armed with the right information, if you know that there's no recovery, that the U.S. economy is not recovering, and we're going to get more stimulus, and not that that stimulus is going to produce the recovery, because it won't, but it is going to have an impact on things. It is going to affect things. It's going to affect prices. It's going to affect exchange rates. It's going to affect economies. It's not going to grow the U.S. economy any more than it grew the U.S. economy in the past. But it does interfere with market forces that are attempting to correct the problems in the U.S. economy. So we know that's going to happen. And so, you know, what you know, what should we be? What should people be doing? Well, first of all, what happened with the gold market? Right, the price of gold uh, in 2013, since what, late spring, gold prices dropped sharply. Why did that happen? It happened because that's about the time that the Fed really started talking about tapering, and the idea that you know the economy was recovering, the Dow was making new highs. And people were jumping to the wrong conclusion that it worked. The crisis is over. It's back to business as usual. The U.S. economy is going to keep on growing. The stock market is going to keep on going up. The Fed's going to normalize interest rates. No reason to own gold. All the, all the problems that we were worried about have been solved. And so all the people who were piling into gold, well, now there's no reason to own it because everything is back to normal. Uh, and... The problems have been solved. Well, that was obvious. That was wrong. Now, I think a lot of the people who sold their gold don't realize that that was wrong. They know the price of gold has come down, and so some people who sold before it went down are probably happy about that decision. They think that they did the right thing. There are probably some people who sold it lower than it is today. Uh, they might be. They might. They still probably think they did the right thing, even though they might have timed it wrong. Uh, you know, I was I did I, I interviewed uh, somebody interviewed me I think it was like Yahoo Finance and the, and, the, and the woman said you know she said well because I was criticizing people who sold who were selling gold and she said well how can you criticize money managers for selling gold I mean it's down thirty five percent it's a bear market why would you criticize somebody for selling a bear market I said well I mean if they sold before the bear market I'm not criticizing them as long as they buy it back but I mean if you're telling me that you know. Why should you wait, watch gold go down 35% and then sell it? Why should, I, why should I applaud somebody for doing that? I mean, now, if it keeps on falling, well, then maybe, you know, I, I'd have to come back and, and eat crow. But, you know, I, was, I, I'm not, I wasn't criticizing the guys that sold it before it went down. I was not criticizing the guys that sold it after it went down. But I'm not going to praise the people who sold it before it went down unless I see when they buy it back. Because it's, you know, it's one thing to sell it. But where do you buy it back? If you sell it seventeen hundred and you don't own it back, and it's at nineteen hundred, was it right to sell? Obviously not. You know, it was right. You know, for a moment in time, it was the same thing the other way around during the you know dot com bubble when I was you know trying to get people to sell their their dot com stocks, and I would be calling clients all the time, um, and a lot of times they would make fun of me because they would say, "Look, you know, you told me to sell it three months ago, and it's up another fifty percent." I said, well, have you sold it yet? No. Well, tell me, talk to me after you sell it and tell me how right you are. And hardly anybody, I mean, but you know, eventually, God, I should have listened to you, you know, because then the stocks you know, collapsed and it didn't matter that they had paper profits because it, wasn't, it didn't matter. So if you sold your gold uh, and now it's lower than you sold it, I mean, you could feel good about it, but if you don't own it, I would be, see, I would be, I would be more nervous to not own gold uh, and, and, and risk it going up than to own it and, and risk it going down. And I think it's going to be very difficult, too, for a lot of these shorts, or not even the shorts, but the people who sold their gold, when they make the decision to buy it back, 
And they're not going to be making that decision in a vacuum. There's going to be a lot of other people who sold their gold who are going to decide they want to buy it back. Where, where is the gold going to come from? And, and where are the prices going to be? Because, you know, a lot of the gold that was sold by speculators was bought by long-term holders, by central banks, institutions, individuals that have no interest in selling anytime soon, regardless of price. I mean, I guess not regardless, I mean, but they're not going to sell it at 1500 or 1600 or 1700 That's not why they bought it. And, you know, the mine output's not going to be there. It's not like all these mines are now producing so much extra gold. When all this demand comes back, all this uh, speculative demand returns to the market. Um, so the prices can go up very quickly. So I think people are going to be very surprised by how quickly gold goes up. And so I think the people who are patting themselves on the back because they got out are going to end up uh, either rebuying it at higher prices than they sold or not rebuying it at all and just uh, you know, missing out on, on those gains. So I think one thing is you can take advantage of the pullback in metals because, again, it's based on several false narratives or false that are not going to happen. This is Bill Big Badge from Borough has connections on the second floor. We are investigating the alarm. Further information will be provided. Thanks. Huh? <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so, so, yeah, sorry, but, uh, we've what? got about 15 minutes left, so I just want to leave a little bit of room for questions. All right, well, let's, I'll just take questions then. We, we need a, to escape, so I don't have any, uh, if there's any questions, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there a way that, like a clean way to measure, you know, GDP? Like, what do you look at, like power generation? Yeah, it's interesting that you point that out because if you actually look at energy consumption in the United States, it's actually gone down rather I mean, substantially over the past uh, five or six years. And in fact, in the last couple of years, it's really gone down. Um, and that conflicts with the idea that the economy is growing because if the economy were getting bigger, we would be using more energy. But we're using less energy, yeah, which is more consistent. On that is, there's more power efficiencies. But no, now, not the last. Your, what, what, no, and in fact, if you look at the chart, if you look at the last two years, there's a huge drop in energy usage. Um, so energy efficient in the last couple of years. It's you know so to me it's very consistent with the anecdotal evidence that the economy is contracting, and you know if you if you think about all the people that have left the labor force. The only way that the economy can be expanding with all these people that are not working is if the rest of Americans are so much more productive than they were. But there's no evidence that those people who are still working have increased their productivity so much that we're, we're producing enough to make up for all the people who are now doing nothing. Um, you know, you look at the record numbers of people now, um, young people, living with their, their parents. You know, it's the highest ever for, you know, uh, kids uh, 22 to, uh, to 40 or whatever that have moved back in. Why, why are they moving back in with their parents? If the economy is expanding, why, why aren't they out there forming their own households? You know, why can't they afford to rent an apartment? Why do they have to live with their parents? Um, you know, all the evidence, I, you know, air, air travel is down. You know, fewer, fewer Americans are flying fewer miles today than a, a few years ago. Well, why? If there's a bigger economy, why isn't the airline industry bigger? Why is it why is it smaller? As I said, you know, you look at a lot of these, these uh, retailers where the sales are collapsing, uh, but credit card debt is rising. So, you know, where's, you know, what are they buying? They're not buying, you know, apparel. Now, they are buying cars, um, but a lot of that is, you know, the fact that the government is financing it and they're getting, you know, 0% financing. It's the things that people can, are borrowing money to buy that they tend to be buying. Um, so I think the evidence is that it's, it's, uh, it's contracting. And then, you know, we're, we're kind of coming up with new ways to pad our GDP. Like we started in the last quarter counting um, as investment spending the money that is spent to produce a movie or to record an album. Um, all that is now investment spending. So it's added, you know, our GDP grew by you know, a few percentage points total uh, because of that. But you know, if you pay Tom Cruise twenty million dollars to do a movie, that's not capital investment. That's salary. That's. But we're now counting that the same as if it was a factory that bought a big piece of equipment. That and the difference is, you know, a, a equipment, a capital good. 
can, can produce more consumer goods. If you give Tom Cruise $20 million to do a movie, it's gone. He did the movie. The movie's been made. That's the consumer good. It's not an investment. We're also counting as investment R&D spending. Even if the R&D spending is a waste because whatever they were researching didn't pan out, it still counts as an investment. That's nonsense. But why are they doing that? Why does the U.S. government want to count R&D and motion picture production as capital investment? Because we have no real capital investment, so we're going to make it up and just throw it into the numbers so it looks bigger. Uh, and so, you know, the, but the GDP, even on its own, isn't the greatest way to measure uh, economic growth because it, there's so many things that it captures. You know, you have a hurricane and it destroys property and now the GDP goes up because we have to replace what was destroyed. But are we better off? Maybe not. And what we replace it with isn't as good as what was destroyed. Uh, it doesn't count leisure. You know, there's a value, there's a lot of value in, in, in leisure. So it's not, you know, it's not the greatest measure. But the fact of the matter is, the reason that our GDP is going up is because we're spending more money. You know, and our debt is rising much faster than our GDP. So how is that a good thing? You know, it's almost it's like if you were a corporation and you just look at your earnings, but not your debt. So if your earnings are going up, but your total shareholder equity keeps going down because you're borrowing more than you're earning, is that a sign of a healthy corporation? No, it's, you know, you'd be an idiot to buy the stock and see that eventually they're going to go broke. That's what we do. We, we focus on one half of the balance sheet. We look at what we're spending, and we don't look at where the money is coming from, and that we have to pay it back. You know, because all this spending now has to come at the expense of a reduction in our future GDP, because we have to pay the money back with interest. You know, if we were borrowing money to build factories, and the factories could produce stuff, then that would be a different story. But we're borrowing to consume, so there's no asset to generate any income. It's all consumer-based debt, government debt, which is consumer debt. Um, but you know, for now, people don't care. But if you look at U.S. GDP relative to the globe, it's shrinking. I mean, the American U.S. America is becoming a smaller part of the global economy, and that's going to continue. And that fact, that trend is going to accelerate dramatically when the dollar gets hit. You know, when the if the dollar were to lose half its value, I mean, that's going to take half of our GDP away relative to everybody else. Yeah. I'll take a bunch of statements, then we'll move on to the practical stuff. Um, kids are living with their parents because they've got 30 to 50 grand for the university debt. So it becomes one of, gee, it's hard to end up strapping on 50 grand for the money towards a new apartment and or a mortgage when you're basically trying to pay off the debt. Number two, basically energy consumption has dropped because of LEDs, compact fluorescent light bulbs, and even Billy Bob's pickup truck is getting more miles per gallon. Not the last two time. years, yeah. Okay. So now we'll move on to the portion of investing. Risk is the first thing that any bum in this chair should be thinking about in any investment. Your statement of house prices are too high probably smacks the biggest terror of most people in this room. So the question is, are house prices 40% too high or 80% too high? Question one. Question two. What's the real inflation rate? Because it's not 0.7 and it's 4.7. Oops, there's a lot of things happening. And number three, at the end of the day, Chris is not here basically as a charity. She needs to make money on commission. Therefore, it becomes one of, okay, give us practical suggestions as to buy gold, buy stocks, buy dollars, and she probably doesn't make any money on the dollar trade, but certainly on the gold and oil trades, yes. Let it risk as far as house prices really should be and are overpriced by X. Yeah, well, there's no way to know where how home prices should be. The market has to determine where they should be. But the price is going to be substantially lower, at least in the United States, because right now, housing prices are, you know, the government guarantees all the mortgages, pretty much all of them. And so, you know, it's like having a cosigner, right, the U.S. government. Where would mortgage rates be if the government wasn't guaranteeing the mortgage? Where would they be if it was just the borrower who had to prove to the lender that he could repay the debt? Well, rates would be much higher because mortgages would be inherently riskier uh, and lending standards would be much tighter. The down payment requirement would be much higher. Uh, a lot of people are still buying houses with 3% down. Uh, that doesn't exist in a world without a government guarantee. You need a 20% down payment, but since most Americans have no savings, uh, they don't have the down payment. So real estate prices would have to come down considerably 
in order for Americans to legitimately afford to buy a house. Um, you also have the, the tax break. Um, now, the tax break is becoming less important as people don't have jobs. Um, but you know, when you have a job, uh, the government gives you a deduction for your mortgage interest. Well, that doesn't help the guy who's buying a house because the value of that subsidy is incorporated into the price of a house. So in every house, is a, the value of that tax break is incorporated into the price. Now, not everybody you know, qualifies for the tax break. I mean, if, you know, you're paying all cash, or, but, but it's there you know, anyway. Um, and so, you know, in, in, I, I'd like to see the tax break removed so that, you know, there's no government incentive to buy versus rent. People just make an economic decision uh, rather than a, a decision based on a government subsidy. So, you know, if you took that away, if you took away the government guaranteed uh, rate, and if you let interest rates rise anyway, right, maybe mortgage rates in America would be 10 percent, 12 percent if you had a, real, a realistic rate of interest, no government guarantee. And then if you took the tax break away, I mean, you know, prices would just tumble. Where they would stop, I don't know. I think prices would go so low that nobody would be building homes in America, which would be a great thing. You see, we still have a big industry building homes. We shouldn't be building those homes. We don't need more homes. We're overhoused. Many of these homes are vacant. We're squandering these resources. We should be building factories to produce products and employ people, not more houses. But it, so if the government got out of the way and housing prices fell dramatically. The has been investigated and all has been found in order. I repeat, all has been found in order. Yeah. So, Thank you. So if housing prices you know, were to come down below the cost of production, which they would because of the cost of raw materials and all the construction costs go up as the dollar goes down, then there would be no houses built. And eventually, we would work off the oversupply. But, but right now, we keep adding to that supply because home prices are being artificially propped up by government. And so builders can keep building. And in fact, what's happened recently is the speculators initially were buying the foreclosures. But they ran out of foreclosures. And now the speculators started to buy directly from the home builders. So they, the, the builders were building for the speculators. That's who's buying them. Not, you know. um, so prices would be a lot lower. Um, but what was the other questions you asked me? The how, how the actual things that we should be buying, such as gold, oil, and that type of thing. Yeah, well, well what it, so the government, housing prices have to come down, but the government doesn't want them to come down. So what's the only thing it can do to stop them from coming down? And that's create more money, right? Print more money so that the dollar loses value instead of houses, right? That's what they need. They need to keep asset prices up. There's only one way to do that, um, and that is to create inflation. Now, it's the nominal price. See, that's what they're considered. They're concerned about the nominal price of that house, not the real price. They don't care how many ounces of gold uh, that house is worth. They care how many dollars. They just need to keep the nominal prices high. So they have to do that with two things when it comes to housing. They need to keep interest rates low because other, because nobody people have to borrow to buy a house. And they have to print a lot of money. So they have to create inflation. And so that's what they're going to do. So what are you going to do? You buy the things that are going to go up because the Fed won't let real estate prices come down. Because they can't let real estate prices come down because then the banks will fail and the government will have to default. The whole, you know, we're all in on housing market. On, you know, we just have to keep it, you know, housing market propped up no matter what. So yeah, you, so gold going to go up, silver is going to go up, oil, other commodities are going to go up. That's what's going to happen. So yes, the house price doesn't collapse but the price of everything else goes up. So in real terms, housing prices are going to come down. There's no way the government can stop that. But they can stop the nominal declines, which is what they're going to do. Now, it's always possible that the government could do the right thing, but it's not very probable. I mean, they, they haven't done the right thing yet, and I don't think it makes sense to bet on them doing the right thing. But even if they do the right thing and the price of gold goes down, the price of houses will go down more. In fact, that ultimately, in order to get back on a viable monetary system, which is really what the world needs, because what we're on now does not work. This, the system that was, began in 1971 does not work. It is an abysmal failure. It has created massive economic imbalances around the world. It's responsible for all these booms and busts, and we still haven't had the, 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 the real bust that's coming. But to get back on a real monetary system, 
which you know you, you need to have real money for capitalism to really work. Um, and so, in order to get back on real money, to have gold at the center of the monetary system and not the dollar, one of two things have to happen: the price of gold has to go way up, or the price of everything else has to come way down. But the, you, you cannot operate the world economy at fourteen hundred dollar gold. It's not going to work. Um, so you can if, if you deflate prices in line with gold, or you revalue gold in, in line with inflated prices. But that, that's so. So either way, you're better off owning gold in terms of your purchasing power, right? Because if if you own gold and gold goes down by fifty percent and everything else goes down by ninety percent, you can buy four times as much stuff with your gold, right? Um, but if it goes the other way around, if you know prices don't collapse but the gold price goes up, but I think that's far more likely. I don't see any real political precedent for the other way around. Now, you can have the, the deflationary. You know, in 1930s, we had big drops in prices in the 1930s, but that's because we were already on a gold standard. You know, they they devalued, right? Roosevelt devalued, but um, but um. They didn't. They didn't just completely inflate, and so you know, prices went down during the 1930s because we stayed on a gold standard. We changed the gold standard. Prices would have gone down more had the government not devalued the dollar from 20 uh, to 35. You know, our gold went from 30, 20 dollars an ounce to 35 dollars an ounce. But prices would have gone down more had the government not done that. But um, we were still on a gold standard. We didn't abandon it. But we're not even we're not we're we're not on it anymore. So there's there's no reason for the government politically to do the right thing. They'll just keep on printing money. But I think that there's a lot more reasons for a lot of the other countries, uh, particularly in the emerging markets that have pegged their currencies to the dollar, to stop what they're doing, to stop these. The, the, they they have more of an incentive. They, there's an immediate benefit to other countries if they simply can let their currencies go up. Everybody's afraid to have an appreciating currency. Everybody wants to have a race to the bottom, as if that's a race that's worth winning. You know, they talk about the currency war, and you know, the, 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 what's, what's so unique about a currency war is that the object is to kill yourself. You know, why would why would you want to win that war? Right? You you want to you know abstain from it. But I think that the countries that are propping us up politically, you know, it's going to be an easier decision for them to just back away and just stop buying dollars let their currencies go up, particularly if they're all doing it. I mean, a lot of times it's, you know, the Indonesians don't want their currency going up against Thailand or against uh, North, uh, South Korea or, you know, everybody is trying to compete over who can sell the most to America when we can't pay for anything. It's kind of amazing that everybody wants to sell to the, to the, to the buyer that, that, that can't pay. And of course, you know, when I talk about paying, giving somebody dollars for their exports isn't paying. We give people dollars because we can't pay. Paying is goods. You trade goods of value. You know, it's, it's trade. And if you don't produce something, that, that, you know, so we don't produce things that our trading partners want. So in lieu of payment, in lieu of products, we give them an IOU. We give them a dollar that theoretically they can redeem in the future for something that we produce. In the meantime, they just use it to buy U.S. treasuries. But the problem is we're never going to be able to produce anything but more treasuries. That's all they can buy. Like there's, you know, unless they're going to come in and start buying up our real estate and our properties and you know, our companies or things like that, assets they could buy. But we're not, going, we're not producing goods that they can consume abroad because you know, we just don't have the infrastructure anymore. We don't have the factories to produce that stuff. Um, uh, what, was, what was I talking about? <laughs> I went off on a tangent. I forget what my original point was. Well, maybe that's a breaking point. It's uh, two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so I know many of you have, uh, have uh, obligations. So... Uh, We'll uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us today, and I'm sure Peter will be available.